Okay, so the topic for today, it's a bit more uh, philosophical um, than we normally see, but I called it Helping Clients Make Better Decisions or Why Richard Thaler Won the Nobel Prize. So a bit of background here. So Richard Thaler uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2017 for, uh, for economics. We got our, uh, a few snide comments before. Yes, there are certain Nobel Prizes that are easier to, to win than others, right? We're not talking, right? It's not every Nobel Prize is, is, uh, is so impressive, but the Nobel Prize in economics tends to actually be an impressive one to win. Uh, so Richard Thaler won it in 2017 um, for creating, for really being one of the fathers of what's become known as behavioral economics. Now, behavioral economics um, has basically, traditionally, Economics um, based itself on theoretical models of theoretical people, what they call econs. Right? People who always make the decisions that are in their financial best interests always naturally because they can see costs, they can see benefits. And economic models are based on that, that people are fundamentally rational and therefore markets which are made up of people are fundamentally rational. Um, now, at some point, psychologists started to note that this isn't always true. People aren't always rational, which in our everyday lives we know uh, to be the case. Um, but for many years, these two disciplines worked separately. Right? Economics worked on the, on the assumption that people are fundamentally rational, and when they're irrational, that's an aberration. And psychology worked on the assumption that people are irrational. Um, and then a... Uh, a uh, joining of forces, shall we say, began um, when certain economists started to realize that it would actually create more accurate models if we try to take the insight that people are not always rational and apply it to economic models and come up with substantive, practical ways to he help people make the rational decisions they want to make anyways, but are psychologically predisposed to not make. Right? And we all know this is true, right? that there are certain things we really want to do. Right? We know are in our best interest, but we don't do it. Right? Whether it be in terms of eating healthy or saving money, or whatever the case may be. Right? These aren't things where these are things we don't want to do. These are things we, if you asked us in a moment of serenity, right? do you want to eat healthier? Do you want to avoid that piece of cake? The answer would be yes. But when the piece of cake is in front of you, you eat it. Now, the same thing is true in economics. Um, and this has produced a fascinating, fascinating body of literature. Just to, to sort of introduce the literature, so in um, Richard Thaler at this point has written two popular books. Um, one is called Nudge, which he wrote before he got, which he wrote several years ago, and then he wrote this one called Misbehaving, which is the makings of behavioral economics. It's more of a narrative of how he came up with the field. Um, in, th in the introduction, he notes that at some point, um, his friend and f fellow Nobel Prize uh, winner, Daniel Kahneman, who I believe Richard Chiner mentioned last week, um, I think, when he dealt a little bit, he touched on behavioral psychology. So Daniel Kahneman co-won the, um, the Nobel Prize for Economics with Amos Tversky, um, two Israeli scholars who were really the fathers of behavioral psychology. Um, so, Amos Tver um, so Daniel Kahneman was, being, was asked, what is Richard Thaler's greatest quality? Um, so Daniel Kahneman said, he's lazy. Um, and, he, and so he happened to actually be there. He was having this interview on the phone, and Thaler actually happened to be in the room, and he starts flailing his hands, and he says, what are you tell, telling anybody my, my greatest quality is that I'm lazy? And he says, no, 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 really, I mean it. He's lazy. He's slothful. And why is that his greatest quality? Because Thaler is so lazy that he only researches things that are interesting enough to wake him up. And therefore, you know that anything he bothered writing about was interesting enough to get him out of bed, and it's probably worth you reading, right? And that's you know how I feel when I read read things by by uh, by Thaler. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do, and we're going to try to know that some of the fundamental insights um, that that Thaler has proposed that aren't just as I said, from the psychologist's perspective, that people are irrational. But taking it the next step and figuring out, okay, but how do I implement that to help people make better decisions in practice? Right? And now as financial advisors, right, this, right, you're giving people advice. How do they manage their affairs? But sometimes you need to take into account the fact that people are irrational and they're not going to make the decisions that are best for them, even if they want to. How do we take the insights of behavioral psychology and actually help people make better decisions? So that's what we're going to try to do. So first... First point, Thaler 
And in the, in the book Nudge, he co-wrote this with another economist named Cass Sunstein, introduced a concept called libertarian paternalism. Now, what is libertarian paternalism? It's a very complicated term for a, a, uh, what's actually not a simple concept, but let's put it out that way. In general, there are two approaches that have dominated uh, in history of how experts should deal with non-experts. One is called paternalism. Paternalism means that the expert knows best and therefore they don't need the input of their client. They need to just make sure that from their perspective, the client does the best thing. So in medicine, this meant that doctors knew what was best for the patient and therefore they wouldn't tell the patient what exactly they had, their prognosis. They would say, look, you are sick. This is the medicine you should take. This is the procedure you should take. And that was it. And that was sort of the way doctors functioned until about the 1950s. At some point, thanks to lawyers suing them um, and other reasons, um, a second model began to, uh, to emerge. Um, the opposite extreme of paternalism is libertarianism. Libertarianism, not in the political sense, but in the philosophical sense, is that people fundamentally have the right to make decisions for themselves, or, in a slightly more cynical notion, they have the right, the God-given right, to make a mess of things if they want. Um, and freedom is more important than the best thing happening to them. Right, that's the philosophy of libertarianism, and that's why now doctors aren't paternalistic. They'll be sued if they are. A doctor's job is to tell the patient, look, this is your prognosis. These, these are the different procedures you could take. These are the costs. Make a decision. You want to make a bad decision? Make it, but it's your decision to make. Right? In medicine, we call this informed consent. Right? We need the patient's consent. But in general... The question of whether it's better for experts to let people mess up in the name of freedom or it's better for experts to decide as experts what's best for their clients stand at two opposite extremes of the philosophical divide, libertarian and paternalist. Thaler and Sunstein came, came, about, came, came along and said, this is a false dichotomy and we're going to introduce something called libertarian paternalism. What is libertarian paternalism? So, here's there the basic philosophy. I gave you a quote number one, but let me say it outside first. What is, stands at the core of libertarianism? Our belief that we should allow people to do what they really want to do. But, the classic divide assumes that the average person actually gets, about, gets around to doing what it is they want to do. And therefore, if the doctor wants the patient to do what they want to do, he should not try to influence them at all. He should just say, here are your choices, right? do whatever you want, freedom. But there are a lot of people, you know, let's take the, let's, you know, this is one of their examples, let's, but let's take the eating healthy one. Right? There are a lot of people that, if you ask them, they'll tell you they want to eat healthy. And therefore, they will tell you that if I come to your house for lunch, you know, it would be great if they're just the dessert didn't come to the table or you had fruit instead of cake. Because if there's fruit on the table, or if there's fruit on the table and cake, I'll eat the fruit. Now, when you invite them over to your house, you have the choice of what you put on the table. Now, but you could also, look, you have to put things on the table. You could put, let's say you're taking out both cake and fruit. So you're not taking away people's choice. But you still have the choice. You don't have room on the table to put them equally next to, next to the person. So you can either put the fr fruit closer to them and the cake farther away, or the cake closer to them and the fruit farther away. So Thaler said it's very simple. Sometimes you're not taking away their freedom. You're putting both on the table. But you have to put one closer to them than the other. Now you have no choice but to, as he calls it, engage in choice architecture. Right? You have to give them a choice. You're not taking away freedom, but you have to decide. Now, you know the person's on a diet. You know they don't want to eat the cake. You don't want to force them not to have the cake. But if you put the fruit in front of them, you're not taking away their freedom, but what you are doing is what he calls, you're nudging them. Right? You're nudging them. And this is what it lies at the heart of libertarian paternalism. That, are, that because often we have no choice but to construct choices we might as well construct choices in such a way that make people make better decisions that they themselves want to make. Right? That's the fundamental insight. And that's not called taking away freedom. 
right? Just to read the quote and then I'll take a question. He says in number one, right? Libertarians, the article is called Libertarian Paternalism is not an oxymoron. Libertarians embrace freedom of choice, and so they deplore paternalism. Paternalists are thought to be deeply skeptical of freedom of choice and to deplore paternal libertarianism. According to the conventional wisdom, libertarians cannot possibly embrace paternalism. The idea of libertarian paternalism seems to be a contradiction in terms. Generalizing from the two studies just described, we intend to unsettle the conventional wisdom here. Libertarian paternalism is a relatively weak and non-intrusive type of paternalism because choices are not blocked or fenced off. In its most cautious forms, libertarian paternalism imposed trivial costs on those who seek to depart from the planner's preferred option. But the approach we recommend nonetheless counts as paternalistic because private and public planners are not trying to track people's anticipated choices, but are self-consciously attempting to move people in directions that will promote their welfare. So this is his fundamental insight. And in number two, I gave you that Thaler's attempt to take this insight and and bring it into practice is what won him the Nobel Prize, and this is from the Nobel Prize announcement. Integrating economics with psychology. Richard H. Thaler has incorporated psychologically realistic assumptions into analysis of economic decision-making. By exploring the consequences of limited rationality, social preferences, and lack of self-control, Right, all things we should be we should be aware of. He's shown how these human traits systematically affect individual decisions as well as market outcomes. In total, Richard Thaler's contributions have built a bridge between the economic and psychological analyses of individual decision making. His empirical fighting, findings and theoretical insights have been instrumental in creating the new and rapidly expanding field of behavioral economics, which has had a profound impact on many areas of economic research and policy. And it's not only parenthetically, that he won the Nobel Prize. This is not just theoretical. Right? People have been taking note of this, and there is a nudge unit since the time of, time of Tony Blair in the British government that actually takes Thaler's insights and brings it into policy. President Obama in the United States incorporated Thaler's ph- philosophy. These are things that actually are making a difference in, uh, in terms of policy. Yeah, you had a question? Well, it's not a question, but this particular approach is often uh, part of successful parenting because, again, we're Correct. to give the children the illusion of choice. <coughs> so this is not the illusion of choice. Let's uh, be careful. This is not the well, illusion of choice. It's a choice, but... So this is not the illusion of choice, but we're going to see what it means, okay? We're, we're going to be careful here. And our, remember, our end goal is to come up with some practical takeaways of how do we help ourselves and our clients make better financial decisions, not against their will, but make the decisions they want to make but aren't good at making, right? That's our goal. Now, three, four, and five point out that halacha actually has a somewhat radical um, philosophy that's actually similar. Um, and this is from the laws of divorce, right? From a totally different category. But the, uh, the Mishnah in Erechen tells you as follows, that there are two things in halacha that are invalid unless, unless the, the subject in question does them of their own volition. One is divorce. A man can only divorce his wife under no duress, right? Under if he's free to make the decision. And the second is bringing a karban chadad, is bringing a sin offering. I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but let's take that, right? The Mishnah says as follows: We can't force, right? By taking a pledge, we can't force someone to bring a sin or a guilt offering. But other sacrifices, burnt offerings, and peace offerings, um, you are allowed to take security to force the subject to bring the sacrifices, even though he won't get full forgiveness until he actually um, he actually brings it willingly. No, but we force him until he says, "I want to." If a husband is is recalcitrant and doesn't want to give a divorce, so in the time of the Talmud, you could force the husband to give a get, give the divorce, but how would you do it? You wouldn't force him directly. You would force him until he says, okay, I want to. So, and the Mishnah in number four says that that's only true if you force him through a Jewish court, but a non-Jewish court wouldn't be able to. But the Ramam in five asked the philosophical question. He says, how could it be? How can it be that on the one hand you say a divorce has to be given of, on the free will, the free volition of the husband, but on the other hand, if he's 
supposed to give a divorce, the court can beat him until he says willingly, okay, okay, I want to give it. Isn't that called coercion? So the Rambam tells you, no. It's only considered compelled if you do something that is not in line with the Torah. Like we beat you until you sold property or bought property. But if your um, evil inclination is pressuring you to not perform a positive commandment or to sin, and the court inflicts punishment until he decides to do it, or refrains from sinning, it's not real coercion. Why? Because deep down, you know what you want to do. But you've been coercing yourself to do things that you don't really want to do. So if someone refuses to divorce his wife when he's supposed to, since he wants to be a good Jew, he wants to do mitzvot, he wants to do positive things, he wants to avoid sins, just he can't help himself, his evil inclination is stopping him, but as the court is forcing him, it weakens his resolve and he res- reverts to what he wants to do anyways. It's considered his well. And the Rambam tells you that sometimes, now, I don't want to get into whether the Rambam is psychoanalyzing correctly, whether you're making a philosophical statement, a halachic statement, but the Rambam makes a fundamental insight that sometimes this person, he fundamentally wants to be a good Jew. The Torah tells him at this point he should divorce his wife, but because of spite, he's not free to do what he really wants to do. Right? He, he's blinded by his own spite. So when the court beats him, until he says, okay, I'll divorce her, even though it looks like coercion, Halacha says it's not coercive, because all you're doing is freeing him from his own spite. You're freeing him from his own blindness. But really, deep down, this is what he wants to do. Now, obviously, this is much more extreme than anything we are going to implement, or Thaler suggests. But the basic insight that sometimes people are trapped by themselves, and to make the best decisions, not from an outsider's perspective, from their perspective... It's necessary to finagle a bit, right? To play with the decisions they're going to make. That insight, halacha, at least recognizes in some form. Okay, so how do you do this in practice? So the next thing I gave you is what's called choice architecture. So what is choice architecture? So this is one of Thaler's... Now, the brilliance of behavioral economics is that many of their insights sound obvious, but we don't think about them and don't articulate them, and therefore we don't do them. So Thaler's... First way of dealing with this is what he calls choice architecture. What is choice architecture? It's a fancy way of saying the following. Most times in life, you need to set up a situation in which choices are possible. And the example he gives in his book is as follows. You are, I don't know, a school principal, at, and you have a cafeteria. Now, you are going to put dessert... You're going to put water and soda and juice. You're going to put fruit and cake. You're going to put healthy food and unhealthy food. All those options are going to be open. But like the person who comes to your your house for a meal, where do you put the food? Right? Do you put, you know, they have a long line where the students go. Do you put dessert first? Right? Do you give them big plates? Or do you give them small plates and put the healthy food first? So that by the time they get to the end of the line, they don't have as much room for dessert. Now, you're not taking away their freedom. right? You have to make a choice. You have to be a choice architect. I mean, you have to give them the choices in some way. It's going along a line. You could choose to put the cake first, and therefore they'll pile their plate with cake. Or you could choose to put the cake last. Right? And they'll run out of space. You can choose to have big plates. You can choose to have small plates. You're not stopping them from getting a second plate. This is not. You're not taking away freedom. All you're doing is, as he calls it, nudging them. You're constructing their choices in a way that they'll make the decisions that are better. So Thaler said, that's not called taking away freedom. That's called having a head on your shoulders and realizing, if I'm already forced to construct choices, I might as well help people make 
better decisions, especially if that's what they really want to do deep down. I don't know if the kids want to eat healthy. So switch it to adults. Fine. And that's what he writes. Decision makers do not make choices in a vacuum. They make them in an environment where many features, noticed and unnoticed, can influence their decisions. The person who creates that environment is, in our terminology, a choice architect. The tools we highlight are, and then he gives you a few examples, defaults, expecting error, understanding mappings, giving feedback, struggling, complex choices, and creating incentives. We're going to come to those. In 7, I gave you a more popular article just to explain what is a nudge. Right? What is nudge theory? So what is a nudge? The concept is a relatively subtle policy shift that encourages people to make decisions that are in their broad self-interest. It's not about penalizing people financially if they don't act in a certain way. It's about making it easier for them to make a certain decision. By knowing how people think, we can make it easier for them to choose what is best for them, their families, and society, wrote Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein in their book Nudge, which was published in 2008. Okay, so let's now take it to practical. The easiest example of choice architecture. Number one, easiest one, but... If you're writing a contract for a new employee, or you are advising someone who's writing a contract for a new employee, single e- easiest one is opt in, opt out. Opt in, opt out. Pension plans. Right, this was Thaler's big insight, and we all know it, but we don't always do it. Right, many employee contracts have an opt in clause for pensions. Right, do I want to put money in my pension or not? We all know this. If it's an opt-in clause, even though if you ask people, do you want to save for retirement and put money in your, reti- in your pension plan, 90% of people will tell you, of course I do. If it's opt-in, they don't do it. And 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, when they come to retirement, they're upset. So Thaler said, why don't you just switch the paradigm? Right? Why is it that all these contracts, employee contracts, have opt-in clauses? Everyone wants to save money. You're not taking away freedom. right? All you do is instead of saying, if you would like to save for your pension, check this box. You say, if you don't want to save for your pension, check this box. That's all you did. Opt-in, opt-out. We will help people do what they want want to do. That was it, right? Simple insight. How successful was it? How successful do you guess it would be when the UK in this exa- in this case decided that in 2012 they legislated that decision that pension plans should be automatic enrollment with an opt out clause instead of an opt in clause, right? Well, Simple. Before they did this, private sector pension schemes jumped from 2.7 million enrollments. After they switched it to opt out, it jumped to 7.7 million enrollments. Right? That's it. Opt in, opt out. And again, this is all things that people wanted to do. Right? This is his insight. People want to do it. So if someone, if a client sits down with you and says, I'm writing up a new contract for my employees. I want to do what's best for my employees. Right? I want them to save. I want them to be smart. Right? Do I write my contract with an opt-in or an opt-out? Thaler says, look, you're not taking away their freedom. You're not doing anything. Big letters. If you want to not put money in your pension, automatically check this box. Right? Options are on the table. Civil liberties, not in, right, you're, not inflicting on, you're not infringing on their civil liberties. Should you make it opt-in or opt-out? Thaler says, look, why don't you help people make the decisions they want to make? You've got to put either an opt-in or an opt-out. Most people want to opt-in. Do it. Right? That was it. That's insight number one. This is very simple. But it, and it has very, very, very... Very, very, very significant implications. It wasn't just um, it wasn't just pensions. They did this with organ donation. So, for example, Germany and Austria, which are very similar in terms of culture, most people in in Austria and Germany, without getting to this halachic or philosophical question, support signing an organ do- donor card. Right? Okay. 
Germany has an opt-in system on the back of their on their back of their driver's license, and Austria has an opt-out. What's the difference in terms of organ donations? Germany, which has an opt-in, has 12% organ donation donation rate. Austria, which has opt-out, has a 99% organ donation rate. Right? Similar cultures, similar percentage of people who support organ donation. And the difference is 87% of the population. Right? We're talking massive changes. Now, very similar to this is a very complicated concept called default. <laughs> default, very complicated. Right? Default. So, you are a financial advisor. You want to, you're helping your clients sit down and figure out where they can cut costs. So, Thaler tells you one of the easiest ways to do it is what he calls set the default option to save money. Again, someone's approached you and said, I want to save money. How do I do it? So, set the default that they should save money. What's an example? So, the example that Thaler himself gives in number eight is, during the presidential campaign, Barack Obama's chief campaign advisor, David... Ploof, plat, ploof, ordered all printers to be put on this setting. Sorry, it should have said on double sided, right? That was in the previous paragraph. He said, right, very simple. Should the automatic setting on the pr company printers be single sided or double sided? He said, set it to double sided so that if someone needs single sided, you're making a flyer, so they'll switch it to single sided. But when you're printing a contract, double sided. He, s he decided, set the default at. Double-sided. The city of Tulsa, Oklahoma alone estimates that it will save 40, more than $41,000 a year with double-sided printing. That was it. Right? He said, you want, someone comes into you and says, how can I save money? So set the default to save money. That's it. Right? There are so many little things because we all know you could have an announcement in your company and say, look, we need to save money. We need to save paper. Paper costs money. It does. It adds up. So if you're printing something that doesn't need to be single-sided, do it double-sided. But we all know that if you set the standard on your printer to single-sided and you make someone actively switch it to double-sided, they'll end up doing it single-sided most of the time. If you set it to double-sided and they need to make a flyer, so they'll set it to single-sided. Big deal. The difference was $41,000 a year. So if you're trying to advise someone how to save money, Thaler says it's very easy. Start by setting the defaults, whatever the default might be, for things that will save you money. Now the Torah has this idea as well. I gave you an example in 9 and 10. The Torah wants people to study Torah. It wants them to be involved in Torah. On an ethical plane, right? We want people to learn. We want people to be involved in good things. So the, so the Mishnah tells you, Shammai Omer, Asei Toratcha Keva. Make your Torah study set. Or as it says elsewhere, Bikoveya itim la Torah. Set, make set times for Torah study. Why is it important to set set times? Why don't you just say that I will study Torah whenever I have free time? Now we all know the answer to that question, right? It's the same reason we all say, right? You can fit, you can plug in anything here, right? To be exercise, right? If I tell you, I want to exercise, who's going to be more successful? The person who says, I exercise every morning, I wake up at 6 o'clock, I exercise from 6.30 to 7.15, I take a shower, I go to work, right? Or the person who says, I will exercise three hours this week whenever I have time, right? Who's going to be more successful, right? We know. So you look at number 10, I gave you a modern commentary on a vote, and he says, Hazman adam limud Torah. The time that a person must dedicate to the study of Torah in the broadest sense of the word, it should be a fixed and rigid framework. Preferably daily. Which will ensure perseverance. If your morning... Your 715, now plug it back in. Study partner, your chavrusa. If that's not set, if that's not your default, you'll never do it. If it's your default, you'll do it. If you're too busy at work, you can't do it, so you won't do it. But the difference between making your default, that I sit down and I learn Torah at 715 in the morning, or saying I'll find time during the day when I have free time, is 
most, most of the time, the difference between whether you'll do it or whether you won't. Right, he says, if you don't do that, because of the stressful involvement in your work, you'll be idle and impoverished of Torah. Right? This isn't just true of economics. It's true of Torah. It's true of religious activity, of moral activity. This is true of everything in life. But what Thaler points out is it's so simple. It's so simple to help people make the decisions they want to make themselves. It's so easy to help people save money by having double-sided printing instead of single-sided printing. It saves thousands of dollars a year. If you're talking to a city, it's for, in the case of Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, not a huge city, but still, $41,000 a year. Because we know, if you tell people, set the default to save money, they'll save money more often than not. If you tell them, set the default to not save money, they won't save money more often than not. Another example, mapping. So what is mapping? So, this is something very practical. I, Thaler is very funny. He's a very funny person. He's very enjoyable to read. So if you want, you know, I really do encourage to uh, encourage people to read the book. It's a fun book. It's very easy to read. This one's Misbehaving. The other one's called Nudge. It's, it helps you make better decisions and it's enjoyable to read. He's very funny, right? You can look at the, you know, the quotes here on the back, right? Malcolm Gladwell right, tells you, if I had to be trapped in an elevator with any contemporary intellectual, I'd pick Richard Thaler, right? Uh, Rory Sutherland says, I'd like, I would like everyone in business to buy this book and claim half the cost on expenses. The book is so enjoyable, it would be improper to claim more, right? It's, he's, a, he's a very enjoyable reader. So this article on mapping, he calls this, oh, sorry, that should be data. This data isn't dull. It improves lives, right? So what's he talking about? So here's what he writes. This is the New York Times opinion piece. He writes, Governments have learned a cheap new way to improve, improve people's lives. Here's the basic recipe. Take data that you and I have already paid a government agency to collect and post it online in a way that computer programmers can easily use. Then wait a few months. Voila! The private sector gets busy creating websites and smartphone apps that reformat the information in ways that are helpful to consumers, workers, and companies. Now, what, pra- what does that mean, right? He says, why do people often make bad decisions? Because they don't have access to the requisite information. But often that information is available, right? whether it be government or whether it be internal to our companies. We have the information available. We know what it is. We just haven't given it to people in an easily digestible way. If you do... It will help people. So what is the practical tip he gives you? He says as follows, look, credit card companies, this is more Roy Terchiner dealt with, right? Roy Terchiner gave a, a, he talked about it a little bit last week, he, said, he told me he talked about anchoring, right? There's the flip side of this, right? The insights of, of, of um, behavioral psychology can be used to trick people, right? He talked about whether that's permitted or not. But credit card companies, let's just put it as it is, use it, do this on purpose, Right? They know that people only understand things that are simple, so they make their terms and conditions so complicated that no one has any idea what they're getting themselves into. Right? They, they do that on purpose. Right? We know that. They do that on purpose. Whether that's a good idea or permitted, right? your chain are dealt with. Let's talk from the office perspective. How do you deal with that? So we said, credit card companies, cell phone companies, all those things, use complex systems to prevent customers from knowing their real fees. Right? Instead of telling you it costs you X number of dollars per year, they tell you, well, it's free the first year and it's $95 every year after that for the next four years, but we give you $300 worth of points up front, so it'll take you three years and two months before you end up equal, but your, but your credit card right, is automatic for seven years, which means that, that on balance, in, over the course of seven years, you will have paid for two of them, but you didn't realize that because all you heard was the first year is three, and then you get $300 worth of credit. Right? You have no idea. And the rates are, well, they're 17% if you don't pay by such and such a day, but we determine it retroactively from the date of payment. Right? They do this on purpose because you can't... So someone comes to you, and they ask your, your help. Right? They ask you, as a financial advisor, what do I do to make sure that I don't get caught up in all of these things? He says, very simple. Go online. There are websites in which you can plug in the credit card that you have or the cell phone you have and 
They will translate it into normal person talk and explain to you how much you're paying. And Thaler says one of the fundamental insights is recognize that the market is trying to confuse people into making bad decisions. Help them get the information and make better decisions. Again, these things are simple, but people don't do them because we don't realize how much psychological forces are working against us. Now, I gave you here um, a few um, insights based on this as well. And this is not actually from Thaler, this is from Dan Ariely, who is another person who, another psychologist who works in these fields. He notes as following, the following. In terms of spending money, credit cards have an advantage and a disadvantage over cash. Here's, here's how it goes. The benefit of credit cards, right, we just talked about the disadvantage of credit cards, but why would someone specifically suggest that you use a credit card or a debit card over cash? Simply because then at the end of the month, it's easier to keep a record. Right? If you start every month with $2,000 in your wallet of cash and you spend everything in cash, right, it's very hard, unless you keep a notepad with you, which you're not going to do, to remember everything you spent on. Credit cards are much easier. On the other hand, there's something called the pain of paying. Right? One of the things that prevents us from spending money is that it hurts to spend money. Credit cards have paid millions and millions of dollars to make it easier for us to not feel that we're spending. Hence, tap. Right? The reason tap was invented, right? you can take your credit card, you don't even have to swipe it and sign anymore, is because credit cards know, and it's true, the easier it is for us to spend money, and the less we have to think about it, the more we'll spend. And therefore, on the one hand, it's beneficial to have a credit card because it helps you keep track of things. On the other hand, if you tap all the time, you forget that you're spending as opposed to cash. When you even buy you know, that water bottle, you feel the pain of paying. So Dan Ariely notes this, and he says you have to balance this properly. But we can use this to our advantage because what do you want to do? If you want someone to save money, so what do you need to do? You need to, A, encourage them to, if they're spending too much, Feel the pain of payment. You need to tell them, feel the pain of payment. You're using your credit card too much, therefore you don't realize you're going into debt. Start paying with cash. On the other hand, what do you want to do to help people save? The problem is we we make ourselves feel the wrong things. Because what do we do? We make, we've already talked about, we should make savings automatic, right? An opt out rather than opt in. But what's the problem? Once we've made it an opt in, We're not encouraged to save more because nobody knows how much money we save. It's not something we talk about. What do we talk about? The new car that you bought, right? So people don't feel, right? People have two things that incentivize them. One is pain. The other is, right? What? Gain, Gain, right? Is gain. It's incentives. So we don't valorize saving because it's something we never talk about, right? If we've managed to encourage people to save by having an opt-in, We don't encourage people to save more because people don't talk about how much money is in their savings account, right? They don't even talk about it amongst themselves. So what Ariely says, look, if people are spending too much and saving too little, what they should do is a few things. One is increase the pain of paying. I pay with cash. Two, make sure saving is automatic, but add to that incentivizing. Now, how do you incentivize? She says, simple. It's not normal in a couple to talk about how much money you're saving for retirement and how easy you're going to have it. So instead, what do you feel? You feel the pressure, right? Your client comes into you and says, you know, we're we're, we're so stressed out, we feel like we don't have money to spend. They don't think about the fact that the reason they don't have enough money to go on a vacation every month is because they're saving a tremendous amount in their 401k and they'll have an easy retirement. If they thought about it a little bit, it would take away the pain of saving. So he says, why don't you talk about it? Tell the couple who comes in front of you right, when they're doing, trying to figure out how to, how to save more to talk about their 401k and imagine a little bit what they are going to do in their retirement. Help them map out their lives so that the things they want to remember and incentivize them are in front and center and the things that aren't, right? Now, these are somewhat contradictory because on one hand, you want saving to be automatic, but on the other hand, you don't want it to be so automatic that people don't think about it because then they regret it. So, that's what Ariely writes. And I, the truth is that the Gemara has the same insight. The Gemara in 14 tells you as follows. 
The Talmud says this in the context of staka and charity. Rabbanan, Tanu Rabbanan, Maaseh Munbaz you know, I'll read in the English. The sages taught there was an incident involving King Munbaz, who liberally gave away his treasures and the treasures of his ancestors in the years of drought, distributing the money to the poor. His brothers and his father's household joined together against him and protested against his actions. They said to him, Your ancestors stored up money in their treasuries and added to the treasuries of their ancestors, and you are liberally distributing it all to the poor. Right? Why are you giving all your money away to charity? King Munbaz said to them, Not so. My ancestors stored up below, meaning in this world, where I'm storing above. As it stated, truth will spring out of the earth and righteousness will go down from heaven. Meaning that the righteous deeds that one has performed are stored up in heaven. My ancestors stored up treasures in a place where the human hand can reach, and so their treasures could have been robbed. Whereas I'm storing up treasures in a place where human hands cannot reach, and so they are secure, as it stated, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. My ancestors stored up something that does not generate profit, as money sitting in the treasury does not increase, whereas I'm storing up something that generates profit, as it stated, say of the righteous, that it shall be well for them, for they eat the fruit of their doings. My ancestors stored up treasures of money, where I'm storing up treasure of souls, as it stated, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. My ancestors stored up for others, for their sons and heirs, when they themselves would pass from this world, whereas I'm storing up for myself, as it stated, and it shall be as righteousness to you. My ancestors stored up for this world, whereas I'm storing up for the world to come, as it stated, and your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Right? What did Munba say? They put front and center the pain of spending money. And therefore they said, don't put money in your spiritual savings plan. He said, no, I'm saving for my ultimate retirement in the world to come. Right? You're looking at the pain, I'm looking at the gain. And that was enough to help him overcome the pain of paying and help him save for the world to come. But what's true in stock is true of a retirement plan. Tell somebody, instead of looking for the fact that you can go on less vacations now, Think about the fact that you're saving up so that you will comfortably be able to go on vacation when you're retired. And suddenly, instead of looking at the pain of your 401k, because you have less money in your bank account at the end of each month, look at the gain of saving. That affects us psychologically so profoundly, and it's what people want to do anyways. Right? That's Taylor's insight. It's what we want to do anyways. But we work against ourselves because we don't allow ourselves to feel the pain of saving when we want to, instead, we, right? We don't feel the pain of paying and therefore we spend too much. Uh, we don't allow ourselves to feel the gain of saving. One more insight from him. This is the last one here. One of the things that he won the Nobel Prize for as well is what he calls the planner doer model. What's the planner doer model? It's pretty simple. It goes like this Companies, if they want to constrain what their employees do, so they're an outside force. You know, they set up rules that make sure that their employees don't, what they don't, want, what, don't do things that they don't want them to do. Right? Plain and simple. Thaler said, think about it. We treat ourselves as third parties. Right? We do. We don't think about it, but we do. We are third parties to ourselves. In what sense? We plan for what we're going to do later. We are third parties to the future Right to the future. That's what we are. We are a third party. It's as if we're an outsider setting rules on our future selves. And therefore, the same things that a company would do to help their employees make the right decisions which are in their, the interest of the company, individuals should do for themselves. Um, and we note this, I gave you in 17, 18, 19, right? The Mishnayot talk about this. Right? That in a religious sense, the rabbis say, right? Calculate the loss of a commandment against its reward and its reward against the sin of its loss. Against its loss. Right? Meaning, if you want to incentivize yourself to do the right thing, so force yourself to make a cost-benefit analysis of the future. Right? Look at yourself as an outsider and say, even though in the here and now I want to do the wrong thing because of the short-term gain, think about the long-term, treat yourself as an outsider, you'll make better decisions. Or, in number 18, don't trust yourself till the day you die. You're going to make bad decisions. We all make bad decisions. Don't assume you're going to make a good decision. Set up ways to make sure that you're going to make the right decision. Or as they say, Don't say that I'll learn Torah when I have time. I'll study Torah when I have time because you might not have time. Recognize your own weakness. Or 19. 
In the first mission break up, they say make a fence for Torah, which normally is rabbinic enactments. But the Yachin number twenty says the The average person, if you want to prevent yourself from doing the wrong things, set up rules for yourself. Because we really are planner doers for ourselves. We know that we're going to be irrational in the moment. So what do we have to do? We have to set up rules for ourselves to make better decisions. The, the Gemara number 21 tells you, gives you an example of rabbinic decree. Right? The rule is you're supposed to say Shema twice a day, once at night. So the, the Gemara just tells you, say Shema as soon as it hits nightfall. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to come home, you're going to have dinner, you're going to take a nap, You'll end up sleeping through the night. You'll never say Shema, right? If you don't do things right away, set a rule for yourself. Do it at the beginning. It won't happen. So Thaler says, takes this insight and says, if we're treating ourselves as outsiders, just like a company, when they want to control their employees, will set up rules, set up rules for yourself. So for example, people, if you, people are too big of spenders, so set rules for yourself. Don't just say, I'll spend less. Say, this Account is off limits, and I'm not allowed to borrow from it. Or I'm allowed to borrow it, but I have to pay interest to myself. Is it irrational? What does it mean? I'm, I, I, of course I'm allowed to use this account. But if you set it as a rule psychologically, it'll flip it, you'll save the money. Furthermore, um, he notes that people save more when they feel like they have more money. It's, it's pretty simple, right? So he says, but who feels like they have more money? And let's say your rule is, I will save 50% of my discretionary income every month. So what counts as discretionary income? If you decide, well, let's say you're an employer now, not an employee. Do you raise your, your employee's salary by $1,000 over the course of the year so that each month they feel like they have an extra few dollars? Or do you give them a $1,000 bonus at the end of the year? He said, if you look at the research, if you raise their salary $1,000 over the course of the year, people will not save from that money. You give them $1,000... Um, bonus at the end of the year, if they've committed to save 50% of the discretionary income, they will save the $500. Why? Because people feel richer when they have $1,000 in their pocket at one shot than if they feel like they have an extra $80 in their pocket every month. Simple, simple things. It's the same reason he notes that most people, if you have the choice between your company um, taking from your salary the amount you'll actually pay in taxes, or as we all do, paying more in taxes and getting a refund... People will save more money overall if they set rules for themselves and get a lump sum at the end of the year than they will if they properly assess it and have less money in their pocket because it's less visible. Right, so th- taking this all together, what Thaler's fundamental insight is, and the Torah, as we've seen, has parallel theories as well, is that when you are advising yourself or anybody else to make financial decisions, spiritual decisions, any decisions... We all tend to make bad decisions, not from an objective perspective, from a subject perspective. We make bad decisions that we don't ourselves want to make. But what Thaler and Sunstein and all the behavioral economists have said, have noticed, is that if that's the case, if we want to help ourselves and our clients, what we have to do is not be blind to our own irrationalities. If a client comes in and says, I want to save money, tell them, okay... Or if an employer comes in and says, I want my clients, my employees to save money. So tell them, fine. Make the pension plan, opt in and opt opt out, they will save. Tell him, lower salaries, give higher bonuses. They'll be happier and they'll save more from the bonuses. If people come in and say, I'm spending too much, tell them, okay, set rules for yourself because then you'll spend less. Make your savings more visible because you'll be more comfortable with it. Make yourself feel the pain of paying. You'll spend less. Don't deny your irrationality. Recognize your irrationality and use your ability in the planner dual model of treating yourself as an outsider to make decisions that you yourself want to make. And therefore, I called it helping clients make better decisions or why Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize. As financial advisors, when someone comes to you, don't just talk in the air and say, well, you have to spend less, right? You have to save more. You have... There are very simple models that research has been done that will help people make the decisions they want to make themselves. And you can help people save a tremendous amount of money and spend a, a heck of a lot less if you just recognize people, people's irrationalities and make the small tweaks that help people make the decisions they want to make themselves. Okay.